tastes like St. Crispin's Day! Ooh, that's a hot mug, guys. Hey guys, this is my review for The King, the new Netflix movie about King Henry V, starring Timothy Chalamet and Joel Edgerton, and directed by David McCold. McCold? I'm actually surprised for two different reasons about this movie. One, David directed the movie War Machine, which sucked. It, it wasn't good. I understood what the point of the movie was, and it really became rectified in the last shot of that movie, but otherwise War Machine is something that no one remembers. This movie, on the other hand, does do very well, and it actually is a pretty good secondary to Kenneth Brennan's King Henry V film. And admittedly, while I was watching this movie, I kept on thinking about that movie, because I actually really enjoy Kenneth Brennan's movie. I love the story of King Henry V. The Battle of Agincourt itself is actually a really cool moment in history, like a cool battle of history that I'm very fascinated with, and the entire King Henry character. Everyone always talks about, you know, Henry VIII, but I've always been more interested in Henry V because not as many people talk about this guy. And this film does a good job of illustrating what made this guy such a standout king, which made him such a standout figure. We see that he doesn't want war, he doesn't want to really be a king because his father screwed it up with all the other provinces and he doesn't want his brother to die. In the end, his brother dies, his dad dies, he becomes king, and he's forced into a war with France. Force being kind of a strong word, especially with how the film ends. But for those of you who have seen King Henry V with Kenneth Brennan, this movie is actually quite similar, except without the whole Shakespeare business, so you'll understand it a little bit easier. And I did like that. I did like that this is a re-upped non-Shakespeare representation of this king character and his whole decision process of going to war with France and the buffoonery, the hierarchy, and the willingness that people will go to battle even when they say they don't want to, and the distrust, the pressure, the immense guilt and weight that he had on his shoulders while he was king. And for most of this movie, it stays pretty true to the Shakespeare film, with probably a little bit more emotional and kind of figurative weight, especially when he had to chop off his cousin's head, and then when they go to the battle. The Battle of Agincourt is a really well shot battle. It is a very technically precise film. This film overall is shot very well, but this battle sequence really, really illustrates how the English were so good with longbows and how they use them to their um, to their favor. Admittedly, not as much because obviously you've got to go in for those really good shots, which by the way, there's a one-off. It's pretty well edited. There are some cuts you can see if you, you look at it a little carefully, but it's their attempt at uh, the what uh, Game of Thrones did. It. They did this better than Game of Thrones did, in my opinion, but I did enjoy this battle. It really showed just how ridiculous and very brutal these battles are. It reminded me of the Robert the Bruce movie that uh, Chris Pine was in that was also produced by Netflix uh, that came out last year, if I'm correct. What I find the most interesting about this movie is the instant the battle ends. There's about another 20, 25 minutes of the movie. As I said earlier, there was two points about this movie that I found very interesting. The second part is what happens right after the Battle of Agincourt, because everything after that is much more interesting than I imagined it would be. In Kenneth Brennan's movie, it basically ends with him meeting Catherine, and that's it. In any sense of what actually happens in this film is a representation of what happened to the actual king, then everything about his quest from going to France to becoming the king of England and France is so much more clouded than I thought it was. And I love the ending for that reason. I love how this film ends. But for some cons, the film does move very slowly. It does have a very simplistic storyline. His relationship with Joel Edgerton, while pretty good, is actually pretty similar to what you're used to. The acting in this film is still phenomenal. I actually admittedly have never seen Shalaman do anything uh, yet. Obviously, Call Me By Your Name is a movie that I keep meaning to watch. I will watch it when I get around to it. I can see where this kid has got his credibility from. He is younger than I am by five years and this kid can act his ass off. It's amazing how good this kid is at acting. I'm massively impressed with his presence, his stature, his voice, his inflection, everything about him 
now proves to me why this kid is such hot meat in the film industry. But in the end, my rating for The King is a five out of seven. This is definitely a positive, a good, Netflix movie, which is rare and far between. It's a lot better than War Machine, so the director can definitely be proud of that. And all in all, it's a very good historical period film, so I would definitely suggest watching it. It's pretty good. Hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, leave a like, and if you're interested in more, maybe subscribe. Otherwise, see you guys next time. Thanks for watching the video. My name is Nitz, and you might remember me from the animated cult classic TV show, Undergrads. It's been a while, but I'm happy to say the click is finally getting back together in an all new movie, thanks to a successful Kickstarter campaign but we are still asking for your support. To see any and all updates about the upcoming Undergrads movie, be sure to check out and like the Bring Back Undergrads Facebook page. And with any luck, we'll see you guys soon.